dig into the word this morning. We start a new sermon series this morning on the life of Moses from May and June. Um, Moses is one of my favorite Old Testament biblical characters. And one thing that's awesome about Moses is he's got something in his story for all of us. There's something we can all relate to. So we're going to be going through his life. We're going to look at um, eight examples over the next so many weeks of things that God did to shape Moses into the leader he was. And do you know, I believe this to be true that God uses the events of your life, the circumstances of your life, every step of the way to shape your story. Amen. And we all have a story. So, and God's not done writing your story if you're here this morning. You still have a story. It's still a work in progress. And one day we get to heaven, you'll see the finished product. Amen. Now I got a little bit of a cult this morning. Who said there could have so much pollen outside? <laughs> like, man, the other day we went outside, it's like, couldn't breathe. I go in the car, and the car is like covered in it. It's like, come on, can it get a break? And Yes, they were in the grocery store, and this lady's like, I'm coughing, and she's like, that sounds like COVID. <laughs> I whipped out my little car, like, not today, see? <laughs> I'm fully vaccinated. She's like, oh, well, good, then you got a cold. Like, I could have told you that before you judged me. <laughs> but I'm like, that's a thing nowadays, isn't it? Like, you go in a restaurant, the store, you hear somebody coughing or sneezing, and what's the first thing you think right away? So, <laughs> but man, this weather's been awesome, though, but man, the stuff floating around get to you. So... I often wondered, Moses, Moses is probably one of the most influential figures of the Old Testament. Arguably, he wrote the first five books of the Bible, called the Torah, the Law. And you often wonder, like, did he look like Brad Pitt or Michael B. Jordan? Anybody knew Michael B. Jordan is? He's a new actor nowadays that everybody says he's the sexiest man alive. He's the most influential guy. He's on the cover of all the magazines and everything. And, um... Aaron back there told me he's in a new movie and he's super cool and he's going to be the latest and greatest superhero or something like that. And Like, I wonder if people like Moses would ever make the cover of one of those magazines. Because nowadays we judge the influence of a man based on his looks and his money. Or maybe something he accomplished. And I often wonder what would happen if we started judging men by their integrity and their character. That the thing that made somebody influential is that they love God. That they were a man of integrity, they had a man of character. Somebody you could trust, somebody you could rely on. Somebody whose word was good versus depending on how they look. Because I always try to get on the cover of those magazines. They never recognize me. I don't have a problem. <laughs> but other than, other than Moses, I mean, Jesus and Paul being arguably the other two that the Bible is mostly made up of their writings, their teachings. I mean, Moses is responsible for the Old Testament, as you see, especially the first five books. And Moses had this incredible thing because he started out life as an orphan. And then he became a prince, and then he became a fugitive, then he became a shepherd, and ultimately he became a prophet of God. So he lived a full life experience. And so there's something, and there's something for all of us in his character and the way that he lived. And I guarantee when Moses was an orphan, no way did he stop, or when he was a prince in Egypt, think, one day I'm going to be a prophet of God. Because Moses, when God first approached Moses, Moses was like, not me, God. You know, and I know there's some of you in the room this morning, you're like that, that God's calling you to do something. You're like, not me, God. But I want you to know this morning that as we go through this journey of Moses, his life, you're going to see that God uses the circumstances of your life to mold you into who he wants you to be and who he knows who you're going to be. Because God, when he looks down, God sees the bigger picture. He, he doesn't look at the person you are today. He looks at the person he knows you are tomorrow. God looks at the potential inside of all of us. And, and each and every one of you are here this morning, you have potential. And Moses is going to teach us that even though we don't think so, because Moses didn't think he had much potential at all, God's like, you got potential. And God is going to teach us through Moses that we all have, we all have that kind of potential. So I wonder, like, who, who is it that you're supposed to be? What does God have for your life that you don't know he has yet? But maybe this year, or next year, or five years from now, you're a completely different person. If you would have asked me when I was younger, growing up in the inner city, inner city streets of Chicago, if I was going to be a pastor or something in West Virginia, I said, no way. <laughs> why, why would I go to West Virginia for it? And here I am. It's God's got a plan. I didn't see it. I mean, the God works that way. It's pretty incredible. And, and parents, we have this wonderful, unique gift that when we're raising our children, we don't know who our kids are going to turn out to be. Amen. It's, like, it's like baking a cake. We toss a bunch of ingredients in a bowl. We put the mixer on. And year after year, we try to shape them and mold them, hoping eventually something good's going to pop out. But you don't know, right? You don't know. It's every year is an adventure. And so this is kind of what Moses is going to see, that God is always working on us in that way. 
<coughs> so if you would turn with me this morning to Exodus chapter 2. Now in the family group on Facebook today, I put to go ahead and read chapter 1 and chapter 2 each week. I'll give you the chapters ahead of time. But we're not going to go through all of chapter 2. But if you read chapter 1 into chapter 2, <coughs> you'd be kind of caught up this morning. <coughs> Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took his wife from a Levite woman. And the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took him, she took for him a basket and made bulrushes and dabbed it in bitmen and pitch. And then she put the child in and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young woman walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her a servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw a child. Behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse you from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the, so the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away, nurse him for me, and I'll give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of water. It's a pretty interesting story in the Bible because we have probably none of us will ever even possibly imagine what it would be like to have give birth to a child that you've got to give up. And you got to give up. And here she's got to give him up three months into having this beautiful baby boy. She's got to give him up for a reason. And here we're in the second book of the Bible. And we got to go back a little bit further into the end of Genesis. See, in the end of Genesis, we read the story of Joseph. And in Joseph's day and age, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. And he ends up in Egypt. Um, Joseph goes and interprets the Pharaoh's dreams of generations earlier. And because Joseph did such a good job interpreting the Pharaoh's dream, Joseph becomes the second in charge of all of Egypt underneath the Pharaoh. Um, a seven-year famine happens, and because the famine is so severe, um, Joseph, is, Joseph ends up having a reunion with his family as his family comes into Egypt seeking provisions. And Joseph ends up having this encounter with his family, restores his family. But that Pharaoh loved Joseph so much, he allowed the Hebrew people to move into their land and settle. And over the course of 400 years, the people grew and they flourished and became a nation. The promise that God made to Abraham was coming true right before all their eyes. They, they continued to grow. So here we are in Moses' day, and we got a different Pharaoh, a different time, a different era. And we got a Pharaoh who is incredibly jealous of the Hebrew people. He looks out at the Hebrew people and says, there's too many of them. And now I'm jealous and I'm worried that they're going to overthrow us. And what if the Hebrew people overthrow us and they take over Egypt? And what are we going to do? So this, this pharaoh is much, much more ruthless. He does what, he does what most um, evil men do. He enslaves people. And he beats them down, and he holds them down, and he, and he makes their life very, very difficult. And, and one of the things he does is he does population control, which is he says for every male-born Hebrew child has to be thrown in the river and, die, and killed. So if you're living in this day and age because you've got a pharaoh who's jealous and worried about the people flourishing, he sets up a, an edict and says, you know what? Every male born must be thrown in the river, and he's going to die. I mean, can you just imagine that for a second, what it would have been like for Moses' mom and her dad to go through such an experience? To know that they gave birth to a baby boy, but his time was very limited? that he's going to have to sooner or later something got to give because she can only hide him for three months. And you can only imagine what it would have been like to have a three-month-year-old. What do you do every time the baby cries or makes a noise or does anything? And you, you worry about your neighbors or somebody's going to turn you in or something's going to happen. And it's quite incredible. And, and yet God chooses Moses' mother to do something so incredible. Exodus chapter 2, 1 and 2 says this, Now a man from the house of Levi went and took his wife, a Levite woman, the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. There's a great chapter in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews is known as the great hall of faith. It recounts all the men and women of the Bible with great faith. Hebrews 11.23 says this, By faith, when he was born and hidden for three months from him by his parents, because they saw the child was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. You can fear the Pharaohs in your life, but you need to fear God more. And you see, we all have things in our life that we fear. And you just things that some fear is good and lots of fear is not so great. But when we fear God, we're giving God his reverent respect. 
When we fear God, we're giving God the glory due his name. We're giving God the trust. We're saying, okay, God, I trust you. And, and Moses' parents were a people of faith. How do we know this? They were Levites. If you know anything about the Old Testament, you know that God chose the Levite tribe to be the priests of the Old Testament. They were the ones in charge of the temple, worship, and setting up the temple. They were the bridge between the holies of holies and humanity. The, and Aaron, which is Moses' brother, is going to end up being the chief of all those priests a little bit later in the story. So, so Moses' parents came from a tribe that was known for having faith. So Moses' parents, in their faith, they're doing what's impossible. In their faith, they're holding this baby for three months. And, and in their faith, I can only imagine that you see Moses' parents, you know, dad's probably working the fields as a slave. He's probably got a hard job. And, and mom is there. And Moses has a sister named Miriam. And this is the young woman of the story. And can you imagine Miriam and Moses' mom, they're sitting around thinking, like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Like, have you ever been in one of those moments where it feels like nothing ever is going to work out? Your backup is against the wall. You don't know how this is going to play out. And yet, even in those moments where things seem completely impossible, God is still orchestrating your future. And they don't realize this yet. So you can imagine the two women, and, Mary, and Moses' mom goes up to Miriam and says, you know what, I got a plan. I'm not going to believe this. I say we take your little brother and put him in a basket or something down the river. <laughs> you can imagine Miriam like, What? <laughs> We're going to take a little basket, we're going to cover it in pitch, which is going to waterproof it, maybe, and then we're going to send it on the river, and we're going to see what happens. I mean, you talk about a last-ditch last ditch effort, you know, you don't know what else, what else could you possibly do, so, but the incredible thing about this is that basket ends up becoming a little ark. You know the story of the ark in the Old Testament, God used the ark to save people. It's the same wood and the same ingredients the ark was made of, the basket was made of. I thought that was pretty cool. Maybe you might think that's cool too. So Moses says, life is in danger from Bert. The Pharaoh wants to kill all baby boys. Moses' mom says, well, here's a little boy, and we think he's kind of fine. Now, how many of you look at your kids this morning like, my kid is fine? <laughs> wow, my, my, kid is good. my kid is pretty good looking. <laughs> First reading through the story, you might walk away thinking that. But really what it means here is that she saw something of value in her child. See, Moses' mom valued Moses in such a way that she saw his value and his worth. And because she saw his value and his worth, she was not willing to put him to death. So she is about to lay it all on the line, and she goes and gets this basket, and she covers it in pitch, and she lays Moses in there. Now, you've got to believe that she's kind of coming up with this. I don't believe this just happened because she knows when the Pharaoh's daughter is going to be bathing. You ever think that? that was, I don't think that was circumstance. I think they were probably thinking about this for three months. What are we going to do with this child? So they go and they set Moses right there in the reeds, right there where the Pharaoh's daughter and them would find him. Now we don't know much about Pharaoh's daughter, but Pharaoh's daughter wasn't like her dad. She actually opened up the basket, saw there was a Hebrew child, and she has great compassion on him. Now imagine little Miriam there. Moses' sister is a little bit older than Moses, but she's pretty young at this point. So we're going to learn more about her in a few weeks. You know, the boldness this girl had to go stand there in a place that she should not have been, very dangerous for her as a Hebrew, and she waits to see what happens with the baby, and as she's the boldness, loves her little brother so much, she looks at the Pharaoh's daughter and says, hey, would you like me to go get a woman to nurse him for you? How many of our little girls in the church would be that bold? And yet she does, and the Pharaoh's daughter's like, yeah, that's probably a really good idea, the baby's crying, and maybe she's never had a kid before, she's not sure what to do with it, so... What happens is they go and they get Moses' mom. And here we have Moses' mom who thought she had just lost her son. She back is up against the wall. She doesn't know what she's going to do about the situation. And yet God is still orchestrating her outcome. And then there's like, here, take him. Nurse him. And, and not only do you get to nurse him, but you know what? I'm going to pay for you to do it. She's got to increase the living. Is God blessing her all the way? And how many of us have those kind of fears? You know, moms, you understand what it's like to fear for your kid, don't you? What about when they go to preschool for the first time? You're about to send them off to school, and your kid's already apprehensive about it, telling you they don't want to go, but you know they have to go. So you go and you drop them off, and you, you're in that line, and, and you get up that morning, you know you're praying that not my kid. My kid is not going to be the crybaby, right? <laughs> no, not my kid. And your kid ends up throwing the biggest fit. <laughs> You had that fear, that fear when they go to the kindergarten or first grade, they go to grade school or, or 
They're like our kids where they had to hop a bus. So you drive them to the bus stop every morning, get on the bus, and you have no idea what's going to happen on the bus. You know, you fear whether it'll be accepted or whether they're going to be bullied or something like that. There's, there's a lot of fears that we have as parents over our children that are healthy. They're healthy things. But you know what? Fear can get out of control pretty easy, too. And this is what COVID has taught us this last year, is that there's sometimes there's a fear that controls our lives. It controls our lives in such a way that now I lose my mind about something. And now I'm not going outside the house because the sky has fallen. You know, lock me up, put me away, throw away the key. You know, my kids can't do this. You know, what about those parents when your kids play sports for the first time? No, this is, I can tell you a funny story, but John says, comes on one time, and John says, I want to learn full contact martial arts, my son John. And I'm like, cool. <laughs> Rami's like, not so cool. <laughs> what do you mean full contact? Well, there's this guy, he's teaching Taekwondo and Jiu Jitsu, and I was like, I want to learn how to do it. I want to be an MMA fighter. And now John was short, like his mom, he wasn't following me, not a very big kid. So Rami's like, what? No. No, he's like, no, I really want to do it. And I'm like, what's the problem? That's kind of cool, you know. I whip it out the checkbook. I'm ready to pay for classes. I, I meet the instructor. Seems like a cool guy. And the lady, the wife, they work together. And I was like, this is great. I took him in the first couple of classes. He's learning all those moves and earning his white belt and he's working up his ladder and all this kind of stuff. And then finally he gets the day where it's sparring day. And so they put the pads on, you got a pad on your head, you got a chest pad, you got little gloves on, you know, you're about to get in there and beat up another kid. And, and I'm sitting there like, go get him. She's like, can we put twice as many pads on him? And she asked the instructor that, like, can my son have twice as many pads? And the guy's like, oh, it's one of them. <laughs> but you know, you get her fair because she doesn't want her baby boy to get hurt. And she's mad at me. She's like, what do you mean? You don't want him to get hurt. I'm like, he'll man up. He'll, he'll get it. Like, it's going to work out. I mean, a punch or two is not going to hurt him. And, but, you know, it's like that. <laughs> when the kids go to play football, how many dads are like, yeah, let's go get it. And mom's like, no, I'm not my baby. I don't want them on the football field. I heard somebody say something. <laughs> you know, baseball. <laughs> You want your kids up for bad. You're like, can you put on the catcher's uniform because they're about to throw a pitch at them. <laughs> you know, you, you had these little fears and things like that. So <clears throat> you can kind of get where Moses' mom will never really understand her fear, though, because can you imagine the fear of losing a child and not losing it because there's anything wrong with a child or anything wrong with you, but because you have no choice because it's the law? What would you do at that moment? Would you actually obey the law or would you look at the law and say, no way? No way. You know, if we go a little bit further in the story here, you know, there's something I want you to know this morning is that when we give God his proper due and respect, you have to learn the most important part about this story here is Moses was born in a time where his life was in danger and it seemed hopeless. And God took a young orphan boy from a young family who didn't know what the future held, who took a risk. And this is going to be the guy that God is going to use to become the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. See, I want you to know this morning that maybe you're in that situation where you don't see it working out. Maybe it's your marriage or it's your relationship or it's your kids or it's your finances. or There's just something in your life you're like, it's not going to work out. And you're ready to throw the towel in because you can't see the future. You're just stuck in your moment and your, and your emotions of right now. And I want you to know that God loves you so much that God is orchestrating your future right before your eyes. You just don't see it yet. See, every one of us has a story, and every one of us has a testimony. And God is working on you right now, and you won't see it till later. I tell people all the time, like, I can see what God is doing in you, but you can't see it. It's only because I've been doing this longer. Some of you have been walking with Christ a long time. You know that you can see the potential in other people. Like, what if you operated in that way this morning, that you actually had the faith that no matter what the odds are, you're just going to trust God? You're just going to trust God. And even if it means you have to sacrifice something, you're going to trust God. See, when she put that baby in the river, you had to believe she was trusting God. She knew that God was going to do She didn't know what God was going to do. And we didn't know what God was going to do. But God had a plan for Moses, and God has a plan for each and every one of us. You know, our job as parents are to raise little Miriams. What if we raise our young boys and our young women that when the world seems like it's against them, have faith. 
What if we raise the kind of kids that our kids will walk the river brink and they'll look for the opportunity and they'll stand there and they'll trust God when nobody else will trust them? What if we raise the kind of kids that have that kind of faith? This is why right now, guys, discipling our kids is so important. I don't want to raise the kind of kids who look at the world and say, I give up. I want to raise the kind of kids who look at the world and say, I want to conquer. I don't want to raise the kind of kids that are going to go with the flow. And if somebody tells them to do something stupid, they're going to do something stupid. I want the kind of kids like, no, that doesn't honor God. I'm not doing that. You could jump off the bridge. I'm not jumping off a bridge. You know, I want the kind of kids that they believe that God is orchestrating their story so they have something to look forward to. And even though they can't see it in the moment, and yes, being a kid is hard nowadays, God is working in each and every one of our kids to orchestrate their story, just like he did Moses' story, just like he did Jesus' story, just like he did Paul's story, just like David's story. I go on and on and on, just like he did my story. Do you believe this morning that God is orchestrating your story? even though you can't see it. You know, I, I love telling this to couples all the time. I love counseling couples, but you always get the ones that they're just not getting along and they're like, I just, we're going to get separation. We're going to get a divorce. You know what? <laughs> there should never be those words from a Christian couple, period. I mean, there's a few reasons for it, so on, but if you believe God was orchestrating your story, then maybe the value you're in right now is only temporary. And maybe the marriage you're looking forward to is coming out on the other end. Maybe right now you got those kind of kids, and you're like, oh, pastor, but you don't get it. My kid's crazy. <laughs> you don't get it. My kid, they talk back. <laughs> and the Bible says, spare the rod. And you don't understand. I really want to hit him with a rod, but I know it. I should, you know. And what if you looked at them and saw the opportunity to disciple their heart? What if we spent more time discipling our kids to believe in a big God than to worry about the world? What if we spent more time worrying about those kind of things? What if we would just step out in faith? Step out in faith. I love the fact that Miriam goes and says, you want to bring a Hebrew mom? And, and you got to understand that Moses' mom, she thought she just gave him up. And yet God was orchestrating her story. And now she gets a chance to raise Moses for the next couple of years until he's of whatever age we don't know to becomes the prince of Egypt and goes through all this kind of stuff. God is orchestrating her story. So she wasn't done. And you got to believe that she discipled his heart because when Moses goes up against Pharaoh, we're talking about this in a couple of weeks, and Pharaoh is threatening all his things like that, Moses, yes, he's afraid of Pharaoh, but he's more afraid of God. And the story of Moses is this, is, is yes, Moses was worried about Pharaoh, and he tells God that, but he trusts God. And because he trusts God, he's more worried about honoring God with his story that he looks to Pharaoh in the face and says, you don't know my God. You don't know my God. <laughs> Hebrews eleven twenty four to 27 says this about Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was growing up, he refused to be called a Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh's, to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured to seeing him who was invisible. The great, the great men of faith in our Bible, Hebrews 11 says, Moses refused to be who he was not going to be. Moses just did not just settle for what was in front of him. Moses knew that there was something greater, and he knew that there was a God that he was following. He knew this. We're going to see this next week in the burning bush. Moses knew that there was something invisible that he couldn't see that he was following. And because he was following somebody that was orchestrating his story, he wasn't okay with just being who he was in the moment. He could have just settled being an Egyptian prince for the rest of his life, lived a life of luxury, who knows what. But the story we're going to read of Moses over the next couple weeks is Moses didn't settle with that because when Moses saw the struggle of his people, Moses stood up and did what most men people won't do. Moses lived almost 120 years, and his life can be divided into three 40-year segments. The first 40 years, he was a prince in Egypt. <coughs> the second 40 years, he goes on the run. He kills an Egyptian. He ends up being a shepherd. And then in the last 40 years, he becomes a prophet of God. And as we look at this over the next couple of weeks, we're going to see that, that each of us are like a Moses. There's different areas of our life that we go through, but God is using the, the, the things around us to orchestrate our story. To orchestrate our story.
but we have to make some choices in our life. See, I know this last year, COVID has taught us one thing is, boy, we can get pretty fearful pretty quick. And I was reminded of this, I was in a grocery store yesterday, because the minute I coughed, I swear 40 people looked at me funny. <laughs> I was like, are we ever going to have a day where that doesn't happen again, where, where somebody can cough and you're not going to freak out? Probably not. You know, but we, we, we got this fear around us. And so many of us allow fear to define who we are. And maybe we're worried about something in our life and a situation or something. But, man, if I trusted the God who was orchestrating the story, I'd have nothing to worry about. Because when I trust that God, when I trust the invisible God, when I walk by faith and not by sight, and I trust in the one who's going to declare himself to be the I am in the weeks ahead, when I trust that God, i got nothing to worry about. Because if that God who created everything is orchestrating my story, what am I worried about? He knows whether I'm going to get cold or not or whether I'm going to get whatever happens. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow in the week and all that kind of stuff. What if I lived my, my life in a way that, that I just had the peace of knowing that God is working and I'm going to walk by faith? That's a blessing right there. That's a, such, such a blessing right there. Hebrews 11, 20, 29 finishes saying this about Moses. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so the destroyer, the firstborn, might not touch them. We're going to talk about Passover in a couple of weeks. By faith, people crossed the Red Sea on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. Moses' says, obedience to God was a matter of life and death for himself and many others. He kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, which vividly portrayed the salvation ultimately accomplished by Christ on the cross. Moses, under his leadership, here's a guy who had no leadership. God's going to cut to him and say, you're going to leave my people. And Moses is like, not me. You ever get that? God's coming to you right now, and God's like, hey, you're going to do something for me, and you're like, not me, God. Yet Moses leads more than a half a million people across the Red Sea. He stands there, and it parts, and he crosses. See, God is in the, not only does God orchestrate our stories, but God is a God who takes unlikely people to do extraordinary things. This has to be good news for you and me this morning. Because I don't know about you, I'm an unlikely person. <laughs> I don't think there's anything special about Bob Ingalls. I'm just, I am who I am, right? But God uses unlikely people to do extraordinary things, which means God is orchestrating your story. You might not feel like anybody special this morning, but God, God thinks the world of you, and God has got something for you. And what if you operated in your life in the way where I believe that? So I'm going to walk around each day saying, you know, God got something for me. You know, so Satan, you might be attacking me today, but God got something for me. You know what, Rami, you might be making me struggle today, but God got something for me. <laughs> She'd probably say that more than I would. <laughs> and when the kids are acting up, you know what, guys, you're not going to drive me up a wall because God's got something for me. When I lose my job, God's got something for me. When a health problem comes up that I wasn't expecting, like a cold, God's got something for me. When I'm facing an illness, a sickness, a pandemic, a financial struggle, emotional struggle, relationship trouble, whatever it is, what if I just looked at whatever went on in my life and said, you know what, God is orchestrating my story because God has got something for me. And yes, I can't see it in the moment. You're not supposed to. <laughs> you got to go through the valley to see the sunshine on the other side. But don't give up. The problem is too many of us give up. And too many of us won't make the basket and we won't cover a pitch and we won't take the chance. Because life is hard. <laughs> life is hard. I'm not denying life isn't hard this morning. Life is very hard. But we give up sometimes too easily. And too easy we get ready to throw the towel in before the victory. And God is working in your story. Do you believe he has something for you this morning? See, God has something for you because, man, we're going to take communion in a few moments. And, and God has got something for you because he sent Jesus to die for you. God would not go through the greatest love story of all time and send his son to die on the cross for you if he didn't have something more for you. See, our salvation is something we work out. It's a, it's a daily experience. It's not like, okay, I got it, I'm done. No, God has begun to work in you. He's going to bring the completion. This is a daily experiment. This is a daily process. And some of us, the sanctification process takes a little bit of time. It takes a little bit of time because you're one of the people that you give up too easy. But see, God is working on you. He's working through your story, and God has something for you. And because God has something for you, he sent Christ to die for you. And he fills you with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus' own words to his disciples were this. 
you will do greater things. We have the power and the victory to overcome whatever obstacle hits our life if we walk by faith. And I think sometimes we forget that, that sometimes I'm going through a struggle. And maybe this one where if we take communion, you need to just confess your struggle. So it's been hard, Lord, lately. I, I get it. It is at times. But maybe you need to confess your struggle and say, but God still got something for me. You know what? Every one of you has a story and a testimony. And some of you have already been through the valley, and you already know what your testimony is. Some of you, you have just entered the valley. You have no idea. So especially you the back there on the worship team. are still so young right now. God's raising up worship leaders in this church. They're going to be incredible. And you might not believe that nowadays, but I believe it. I can see it. And God, you might look around the church right now and say, well, it's, a, it's a small church. You know, what are they doing? I, got, I know God is orchestrating a story around here, and God's got something for us. I mean, God's proven that every step of the way. So when you take communion this morning, you got to remember that Jesus loved you so much that he went to the cross for you. And yet your story is this. We were all sinners, and Christ died for us. We all have problems. We're all rebellious. We all make a mess of our lives at times. And, and maybe we're struggling with our spouse or, or our kids or whatever the struggle is this morning. And, and maybe I just need to go to communion and say, you know what, Jesus, I need, just need to confess my struggle. I need to get something off my chest. I need, I need to go to the altar. I need to pray before I take communion this morning. So when I take communion, my heart is right. And remember that his body that was beaten and broken for us, his blood that was poured out for us, was the greatest act of love of all times. And if you don't believe God is orchestrating your story this morning, you just need to stop and look at communion and say, God's got something for me. God's got something for me. None of us were born in the time of Moses, and none of us can relate, but we all know what fear is. And fear has the ability to either control us or it gets surrendered. This last year in the Chicago Sun-Times, um, probably many, it's a worldwide newspaper, not just Chicago, but anyways, top five things people fear. Listen to this. Number one this year, 78% of parents said they fear COVID. 78% of parents, they, they, over 10,000 couples, 78% said they fear their kid getting COVID. The second one is the future. With all the unknowns today, parents worry more about what kind of future their children will have. 57% of parents. Then this one surprised me. 61% of parents worry about bullying. You worry that your kid's going to go to school and fit in or whether they'll be accepted or whether they'll be bullied. They're worried about what's going to happen in school. The fourth one was safety. Every time the kid leaves the house, gets on the bus, or walks to school, you worry 40%, 47% of parents worry that something's going to happen to their child from the time they leave before they get to school. And number five, which is a great one, is screen time. 77% of wor parents worry whether their kids are on social media or video games too much and whether screen time is poisoning their mind or not. I, got a, I thought that was pretty incredible because I really 77% of parents think that they're worried about screen time, but I don't see any parents taking the phone away. When was the last time you saw parents like, give me that, you've been out of four hours, you're done. You know, we have each one of these things we could look at, and I'm not going to break them down this morning, but... If we knew that God had something for us and God was orchestrating our story, would I really worry about such things? If I knew God had something for my children, he was orchestrating their story, would I really worry about those things? Yeah, I'd worry about the ones I could control. I do think God's going to hold us accountable for screen time someday. You know, your three-year-old's on social media for six hours a day, you might be having a problem. <laughs> you know, your little one's watching TikTok. A lady the other day said, Oh, my little one's interested. He's watching TikTok videos. And this like, four-year-old kid watching TikTok. And he's watching all the rump-shaking, booty-shaking videos, and you could tell. And the mom's just like, well, it entertains him. Like, really? <laughs> you, you can't find, like, what happened to, to Franklin <laughs> or Pepper Pig or whatever these kids watch nowadays that your kid's on TikTok. <coughs> it's crazy. <coughs> Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, and God, it's such an incredible reminder as we open Genesis 2 that, God, you have something for us. God, I can't imagine what Moses' parents went through, and God, I can't imagine what Moses' mom was thinking when she came up with this plan, or even what Miriam thought is they were going to carry it out. 
But God, I can only imagine the celebration they had when I set Moses down in the reeds and, and Pharaoh's daughter picked him up. Lord, I can only imagine the celebration they had when Pharaoh's daughter called her, called Moses' mom to nurse him and paid her to do it and allowed her to take care of him for the years ahead. God, sometimes we can't see the outcome of the situation that's around us, but God, we know that you're the God who orchestrates stories. God, we know that just like Moses, right now you're working in each and every one of our situation, God, for, your, for our stories, for your glory, God, that you're doing something in our lives that we can't see. And God, we pray that we would have the strength this morning to never give up. As Paul said, God, we are running a race, Lord, and sometimes we run around those hills, we run around those corners, and those valleys in our life, it's a little bit difficult. God, give us the strength to not give up. God, give us the strength to not stop, Lord, until we see one day what that story is all about. And God, I pray in this room and in this church, Lord, that you would use our story for your glory, God, that there'd be so many testimonies of your richness and your goodness and your grace and your mercy and your love, God, that we would testify. Now, God, I know for many parents in the room this morning, there's lots of things we fear. And God, the world's a scary place. God, I pray this morning that you would give us the boldness of faith to trust you that no matter what goes on in the world around us, we trust you with our children. God, we know that when our kids leave, their, leave the house, God, you are still with them every step of the way. God, we pray that we would leave our safety, their safety, their protection in your hands. And God, I pray that one thing we would worry about is that we would worry about discipling our children's hearts so that they learn to follow Jesus. So when that day comes, they say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Now, Lord, I pray as we take communion this morning, you would help each of us to examine our hearts, to, to just let go of things that we should. God, I pray for anybody in the room this morning who's dealing with some fear, Lord, that they be healed from it in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for a relationship in the, in the church this morning that's struggling. They be healed in the name of Jesus. I, I pray for a financial situation or a, a physical situation or, or whatever it is, God, that's coming against our families, Lord. We ask for your mercy. We ask for your grace. We ask for your forgiveness. And, Lord, we ask for your peace. And Lord, I pray as we enter this Moses journey, God, that there be some Moseses in this church, somebody who doesn't believe that you want to use them, but over the weeks ahead will realize, God, that you have a plan for them, you've gifted them, you are with them, and they're meant to do great things, and, and maybe it's time we unlock greatness in the church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, you're all right. Now, in New Beginnings, I think I've said this before, but... We practice what's called the open communion table, so you're welcome to take communion as long as you're a believer in Jesus Christ. We don't have no membership classes on that kind of stuff. If, you, if you're my sister and I'm your brother, amen. Uh, because I have a code, I've asked the, my wife, Romy, first lady, to serve communion this morning. <laughs> she, does, <laughs> she does not like that title, first lady. It's like such a thing. <laughs> but we're going to sing and worship for you this morning. Take as much time as you can. Don't feel like you got to rush. If you need to come to the altar and spend time with Jesus, if you need prayer this morning, we'll pray with you. Um, take communion back to your seat and just spend some time. And you know what I think sometimes we forget is as we go through church, and church runs through an hour real quick, but we're not really on the clock. So if we need to worship a little longer, we need to pray a little longer this morning, take as much time as you want. So if you need to be in here for a whole other hour to get right with Jesus, I'll stay with you for an hour. <laughs> <laughs>